Thank you for joining us for this special series of This is Getting Old, sponsored by the 2020 George Washington University's University Seminar Series, Towards Age Friendly is brought to you by Melissa B., Ph.D., in collaboration with GW Center for Aging, Health, and Humanities. Welcome to This is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and today we're going to be talking about the Age Friendly Health Systems Initiative and the 4Ms framework, specifically talking about mobility. And mobility is a critical aspect of the 4Ms framework because you have to move every day safely in order to maintain your function so that you can do what matters. So today I'm joined by Dr. Tahira Lodi. Um, welcome um, again. So maybe just do a quick introduction and then we'll dive into mobility and talk about um, what we need to know about that. I'm Tahira Lodi. I am an assistant uh, professor of medicine um, in the division of geriatrics and palliative care at George Washington University. And in this capacity, I've been working uh, with medical students, uh, residents and fellows uh, and taking care of my patients in uh, every setting of geriatrics, outpatient, inpatient, and long-term care settings. Um, uh, that's what I do. All right, well, welcome, uh, welcome back. Um, so when we use the term mobility, um, what exactly are, are we talking about? So in general, we are talking about movement of patients in their environment. It is an indicator of uh, how well your patient is able to live independently in the community and in their own homes. Okay. Um, right. And I can remember, I know that actually with uh, the, the blue zones, that's um, a study that was done with National Geographic and I think National Institute for Aging. Um, where they interviewed you know, all these centenarians and their five hotspots around the world. And so the, and came up with these nine principles. And the first one was to move naturally. And I can remember when I heard that statement made um, at a national conference, I was like, oh, like what a relief. We don't have to like be training for marathons, um, but movement is important. Um, so it has to do with you know, how well you're, you walk, but also your balance and your strength. Um, because how well you can get around um, matters. So what are like some of the things, like if you're you know, at home, you know, or I guess really any um, care setting, what are some of the things that we need um, to look for or be aware of both as a patient and a provider? So as a provider and as a patient, you know, knowing uh, your life space, your, uh, the, what you are able to do is a concept where um, it tells you how mobile or interactive your patient is with the surroundings, uh, which, may be, which may narrow over time, but that's very important for us to know as providers, whether this patient is, uh, okay, um, what, uh, traveling in the community, taking public transport and going places, or this patient is now confined to the home or uh, confined to assisted living or nursing home, that life space uh, uh, concept is very important for us to know, to see how functional our patients are. Um, in addition, uh, you know, it, it's important for us to know this because this is a concept that has been associated not only with the onset of debility in future, but also has been associated with decline in medical conditions like COPD. So uh, that's that's important for us to know. And so all that is important um, to know like what level of engagement that older adult has with you know, the broader community um, within their neighborhood and also within you know, their own home, um, as well as you know, kind of the built environment, like how safe are the sidewalks where they, they live, um, do they need adaptive equipment? So um, in terms of daily movement, um, what do you think like a daily goal should be for someone? So based on the best evidence we have, any increased level of activity from baseline is good. But the goals and targets that we have based on evidence is 30 minutes of uh, regular physical activity moderate level physical activity uh, five days a week. And that could be something as simple as walking on a level surface for 30 minutes a day. Uh, wh what I tell my patients is 
if they are not doing that level of activity, they can start with as low as five minutes a day, uh, which would be an upgrade if they are not doing any of that activity at all uh, and build it up slowly. That's, that's the evidence we have so far. Right, and to, to realize too, they don't have to walk for 30 minutes continuously. You could even do like three 10 minute segments. And so I know like even in my world, my you know, there's also technology to help you know, with this as well. So my Apple watch will tell me, you know, hey, it's time for you to get up, you know, to stand up and right. go do something. Right. Um, and I can remember the geriatrician that I, that I used to work for, she was like, you know, what's the most important muscle, muscles in your body? And I was like, I don't really know. And she's like, your quads, you have to, you know, have strong quads or you're not gonna be able to get up and, you know, up and down from your chair. And so I've always kind of, that's always kind of stuck with me. It's like, so squats are, are good. We definitely need to, uh, to be sure that we're uh, keeping, keeping those strong as well. So what are um, some of the other things um, that we need to do? Even maybe somebody has like an impairment that we need to, to manage or something that's interfering with their ability to move. What are some of the things that we need to keep in mind? Right. So uh, keeping in mind the common um... Uh, morbidities or comorbidities our patients have like art arthritis uh, and pain secondary to arthritis that might interfere with our patient's ability to move around. It's our responsibility to make sure we manage the pain in a way that's least inhibitory for our patients. Make sure we pick out the medications that don't make them drowsy and they are able to uh, move around. Uh, make sure the environment that they are in is safe enough and they are not... Uh, for example, uh, area rugs that could be a potential for, for fall. Make sure they have area where they can move around in their um, environment. Um, think about all the medications we are prescribing them. Uh, polypharmacy, we've already spoken about, um, but uh, patients who are on blood pressure medications, make sure they're not getting dizzy when they get up from a seated position. Uh, and uh, may pose a fall risk. Make sure there is um, good lighting in the area they're in uh, so that um, they can see uh, if they're using uh, glasses, make sure they are not multifocals that can uh, make the depth perception go off and um, they can uh, walk around easily. Teach and educate our patients about uh, the mobility devices if they are using one. Um, that they are their friends. All of us are entitled to our vanities, but safety comes first. Right, but and so two thoughts I had. Um, one is that um, you know, for every day that an older adult spends in the bed, you know, it takes them about three weeks to recover from that. So daily movement, you know, is important. And you know, then the the flip side of that um, is just making sure that. Um, that we are, you know, there are home safety evaluations that people can do. Um, if you're in a hospital setting, to to make sure that they're you're that they're removing your catheter or getting your IV out as soon as possible, so that you can get up and go to the bathroom. And to be aware that medications can actually um, impair someone. To, and in nursing homes, we call those chemical restraints versus if they tie you down the bed, that's a physical restraint. And I think a physical restraint's much easier to see than to realize that someone um, has been given a sedative and now they're sleeping um, because that's not gonna be good for them either. Um, and then let's talk about some of the different um, assessments that providers can do, or even, you know, I would think it would be good for anyone to know, you know, what, what do you need to look for to make sure that you are able to get up and move like you need to. Right. So. Um... Get up and go test is a very easy to perform test uh, uh, in, in outpatient settings. Again, depending on your patient's mobility, uh, basically you ask your patient to get up from a seated position, uh, pay attention to whether they're using their chairs, uh, how are they getting up, how are they walking, how are they turning around and coming back and sitting in the chair is a very easy test to do in any setting. Um, it varies, you know, uh, what environment you are in and whether you're able to perform that test or not, or your patient is able to get up and uh, walk around for you. Um, a six minute walk test uh, is another test that can be done uh, to assess mobility and uh, uh, gait in our patients. Um, again, 
Geriatrics is interdisciplinary. Make sure you have your um, physical therapist and your occupational therapists working with you to provide um, pro professional uh, you know, evaluations and assessments about potential risks for falls in your older adult population. Uh, we are very lucky at GW uh, to now have a physical therapist and it's very exciting to have her with us because she goes in before me and evaluates my patients and tells me exactly what my patient might need, whether outpatient physical therapy would be appropriate or I need to set up home health uh, physical therapy for them. So those are some easy uh, things to do that we can set up for our patients is, uh, and even have their home safety evaluation set up so that we, we, we can use our assessments and put them to good use. Uh, but other than that, as providers, uh, looking at the patient's medications, managing their pain, uh, moving any physical and like you said, chemical restraints that might be interfering with mobility uh, are very important to keep in mind on every visit as uh, for all our patients uh, as providers for all of us. All right, and then I also wanted to bring up the point, you know, with the adaptive equipment, if it's a cane or a walker, you know, to really be sure that you're using those properly because you don't like, they're, they're there to support you or to facilitate your ability to walk safely, but that you shouldn't be leaning on them, um, you know, just because it creates this false third kind of, prong for your balance you know so really trying to still maintain your balance on your own but that's there for safety and then I've also had questions where people have asked me before they're like what about those recliners that kind of push you out of you know the chair and I've always you know not recommended people get those because it you know it's not really going to help you maintain that quad strength and your and your core strength to be able to get up and down you know from a chair so don't buy a soft, cushy recliner that you can't get out of. You right. know, so thinking about through when you're thinking that through when you're thinking about furniture in your home. And then the other time I had this lady ask me about a scooter and she like walked in and could do everything, but she was telling me that she kind of would sometimes get off balance. But the way she demonstrated it, she goes, so sometimes she goes like the other day I had to like brace myself on the wall. But when she did it, like she jumps into this like Spider-Man leap and holds onto the wall. <laughs> and I was like, if you have that much mobility and like flexibility and balance, like we need to, you need to keep doing that. Like don't think just because Medicare would cover a scooter that, that it's a good thing for you to have. So making sure that people are very mindful that some of this technology can actually be debilitating exactly. and not help you maintain exactly. function. Not only that, but it can be sometimes downright, uh, you know, dangerous for something that props my patient up and they, for especially for patients with Parkinson's or other neurologic disorders, you know, they are suddenly made to uh, get up and balance themselves. It's just not possible for them. And right, or it's going to tilt them be, the other way. Exactly. They can be a potential for fall right away. So I definitely do not recommend them. If somebody has a scooter, I want to make sure, you know, cognitively they are intact enough to be able to use it um, and not bang into walls or end up, you know, hurting themselves more than they would help basically. And I want to avoid a scooter as much as possible because uh, otherwise, you know, my patient is going to lose the mobility that they already have. Right. And that's kind of, you know, I equate that to like, you know, my teenage son wants to ride those little bird scooters and I'm like, get on your bike, you know, like, <laughs> I know it's fun it's, and that's okay every now and then, um, right. but, but not what you need to be doing every day. So and talking about what are some, so now let's kind of segue into what are some of the things that we need to do um, and think about every day for mobility, regardless of your care setting. We talked about some for home. Right. So um, wherever you are, um, again, th there is no uh, evidence about it, but I tell my patients every hour that you're sitting, you need to get up and walk around for five to 10 minutes, even if it is walking around in your living room or, or in your room. In, in long-term care settings, you know, depending on the space, sometimes I just have my patients uh, with dementia just walk the hallways and um, that makes a huge difference. Uh, any activity level uh, above their baseline is, is beneficial. 
Um, uh, make sure your patients who are living in, for example, assisted living facilities, make sure they go uh, for their meals in the in the dining ho uh, hall three times a day. Uh, at least that would get them out of their um, uh, their apartments um, when whenever possible. Uh, even if it is going in a courtyard and walking around for thirty minutes. Um, or if they if somebody has a space outside, it used to be I, I used to tell patients to go in the closest mall uh, and walk around there with COVID. I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, we have a lot of limitations right now. But, but they, they call that program silver sneakers. Yes, and a lot of malls do have them. Um, <laughs> they still have them. Yes. Um, referral to physical therapy. Um, I think that's my uh, I, for, for a geriatrician, that's the best resource we have to make sure our patients are ambulating safely. Uh, if they have to use medical equipment, they are using them uh, correctly. They've been properly fitted for the, for the uh, equipment and they're not bending over or distorting uh, um, their body to be able to use it. Okay. And I had a couple of things, you know, like I said, you know, my Apple Watch reminds me every hour to stand up and, and walk around for a few minutes. Um, but there's another program uh, for like assisted living, long-term care facilities. Uh, I've done an interview prior with um, Dr. Tracy Yap, who's now at Duke. And she has an intervention where they paired music with cueing. And so every hour, a song that the residents, you know, and or the staff have picked out, typically from like the residents, you know, time frame that song will play and everyone in the facility is supposed to get up and move, you know, dance in place or stand up. And what they found is it had a 45% protective effect for everyone in the building against developing a pressure ulcer wow. or a pressure injury. And so movement is important. Um, and so figuring out how, how can you build cues into your environment to make sure that you are getting up and moving. And, you know, I think with the blue zones, you know, they are recommending you know, 10,000 steps a day. So that's really kind of where that comes from mm -hmm. um, to be moving, to do, um, do all of your activities. So, so thank you for being with me today to talk about the 4Ms framework related to mobility and um, what we need to be aware of as we move towards a, a widespread age-friendly health system. So please be sure to check out the overview of the age-friendly health systems podcast with Drs. Alice Bonner and Terry Fulmer and the other podcasts related to the remaining four M's, medication, mentation, and what matters. So thank you for being with me today, Tahira. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this special series of This is Getting Old, sponsored by the 2020 George Washington University's University Seminar Series, Towards Age Friendly is brought to you by Melissa B., PhD, in collaboration with GW Center for Aging, Health, and Humanities.